Okay, how's it going everybody? I hope you're all doing well. Okay, well so in this episode I thought I'd try something different and try to say something about about dogs. Okay, so I think that dogs give us a muted but important connection to nature. A nature that we are increasingly cutting ourselves off from, but whose severity and uh, inhumanity would otherwise overwhelm us. In a way, you could say that dogs, well, they're kind of the ambassadors of that nature and uh, safe portals into it. After all, let's not forget that dogs, even pugs and poodles who may not look the part, come from wolves. Specifically, it seems from, from an extinct wolf species. They're a domesticated form of the large carnivore wolf, domesticated by, by hunter-gatherers more than... Um, 15,000 years ago or so. Okay, but how exactly did we do this? How did these aggressive carnivores become our best friends? Well, nobody knows for certain. Maybe it was the consequence of a solitary hunter looking after an injured wolf. Or maybe it was the result of a few friendly wolves hanging around the hunter-gatherer camp waiting for uh, some kind of leftover food. Presumably, then, these, these few friendly outlier wolves would have had an advantage over the other wolves. If this is true, then, then wolves, through survival of the friendliest, largely domesticated themselves among hunter-gatherer people. This might partly explain why later dogs have this capacity to form affectionate relationships with other species. In short, why they're able to love. You know, there's, a, there's an amazing and a heartwarming episode in Homer's Odyssey. It's when Odysseus comes home to Ithaca after having been away for 20 years. Now, as soon as he sets foot on his island, um, the goddess Athena changes Odysseus' appearance to make him look like an old, disheveled man and beggar. She does this because she doesn't want the suitors who have taken over his home to, to recognize him. This way he can gain information without being detected and test the loyalty of those around his home and his family. Anyway, it works. When he enters his uh, old property, he goes unrecognized by everybody, including his uh, best friend and even, initially, his own wife, Penelope. There is someone who does recognize him, though, even though he's been uh, dramatically changed. And that's Argos, his old faithful dog. In one of the most touching scenes of the story, when Odysseus enters, Argos immediately recognizes his master and begins to uh, wag his tail. But uh, he's very old now, and he can't get up from his bed. As greeting Argos would betray who he was, Odysseus just walks past him, pretending to ignore him. But um, he sheds a tear when he does this. Old Argos dies a few moments later. You know, it's interesting. Plato, of all people, claimed that dogs are the true philosophers. They're the true philosophers because they just know the face of a friend. Unlike uh, people who are often deceived about appearances, dogs just seem to know, in some deep sense, who you are. Like Argos, they have this capacity for, for the truth when it comes to genuine recognition and connection. In dogs, as in Plato, love and truth are one. Cats are uh, quite different from dogs, though, aren't they? I mean, dogs are pretty much incapable of the cat's undependability. Fidelity is all dogs really know. As the uh, philosopher Jean Grenier once said, dogs have a long time ago forsaken everything for their journey with us, asking nothing but the privilege to lay beside us. As uh, Lord Byron wrote about his own dog, he said, the first to welcome, foremost to defend, whose honest heart is still his master's own, 
who labors and fights and lives and breathes for him alone. I mean, uh, doesn't every morning with your dog begin with a look of love and, uh, and confidence and excitement? There's not a dog in the world in whose eyes we are ugly or old or worthless, right? In their soft glances, they give us back a worth or a dignity that is often hard to hold on to in a human world full of, uh, of judgments and um, coldness and unavailability. In this way, I think you could argue that more time with dogs prevents our best and most sentimental feelings from getting blunted. And there's uh, so much more we can learn from dogs. I mean, for example, as plagued by consciousness and anxiety as we are, dogs can grace us with their unconscious peace. Being around them, we can get to share in their, um, in their deep serenity and their drowsy moments. And of course, from dogs, we can learn to make the most of the present. A present that for them swells that has the, um, the fullness of an egg that's totally self-sufficient and lacking in nothing. But um, here's the thing though. At the end of the day, unlike a human child, to get a dog is to outlive it. It is therefore to, to knowingly open oneself up to, to many moments of joy, yeah. But also to profound moments of loss and sadness. But we can take something important from this, and that's this. To watch an entire life unfold and end in just a few years can serve to heighten our appreciation of that life and our relationship to it. In this way too, such relationships can remind us to take stock now of our own tragic dimensions and not wait for what it takes a lifetime for most of us to realize. Bye for now.